Another passion of my youth was toy soldiers. I always wanted to join them, get in amongst them, and fight battles with them. And now, 50 years later, it looks as if my passion is coming true, because Roy Dilley is using me as a subject for one of his military models. Roy, is this, this pose all right? Yes, that's fine, Bob. Hold it right there. What I'm doing now, I've got the pose, I think, and I'm just going to clean up the joints. That's excellent. Now we're going to get down to the actual personalization of it, Bob, and I'm going to apply your beard. If this will be put on with a liquid plastic, which is made by dissolving little bits of plastic in a solvent. Mm -hmm. And this has the great advantage that you can actually paint the detail on to the model with a paintbrush. It does take a little while to harden off, but once it's hard, it is in effect welded onto the base plastic and becomes part of it. Now that you're going to paint it, how do you go about doing that? We start by arriving at a flesh mix which matches up with the subject's face. In your case, you either put a nice rosy complexion. And this is painted overall, the entire uh, head and face area. Mm -hmm. This is all terrifically skillful, Roy. But isn't it just simply playing in toy soldiers? Well, no more than you chaps play with model railways. And in fact, the hobby now has developed to such an extent that it is a true art form. And you can make dioramas which, in fact, have a, a narrative and tell a story. For instance, this model of the Western Front in 1916. You, you can actually show people what it was like, what it was like to be there. That is how the ground was broken up, the effect of high explosive and rain and barbed wire. The conditions were so appalling. And how much more appalling they would have been for men trying to get forward over it. There is a, a roadway or a pathway laid, duck boarding as it was called, or trench boarding, so that the men aren't actually standing on the ground but standing on wood above the ground. Underneath that, there were drains dug. You can see a sapper here, look, with his spade and his little pickets where he's trying to repair a, bit, uh, a part of the trench that has actually been subject to a, a direct hit by a shell. The sordidness of the um, of trench warfare is brought out in the model by the fact that we've got a little dump of uh, empty tin cans. Well, they may uh, well be empty food cans, but in fact they were used by the troops as uh, improvised latrines. The men living under these appalling conditions in the trenches nevertheless made some sort of pathetic attempts to turn the trench into home. You had this situation existing for nearly four years, you see, on the Western Front, whereas in our war there was relative mobility people got about. Roy, it'll be a relief to get away from Dennis Green's model of this hateful situation. Let's turn to the lesser horrors of the Second World War's battlefields. How are you getting on with painting a U Western Desert model? Well, there's your finished self, Bob. Yes, I wish I was as slim as that nowadays. Well, let's put you back into the mid-war years in the Western Desert. Go and have a cup of tea with some of the boys outside Tobruk. I suppose I look slightly out of place amongst all these soldiers, but I was there all right. I can still remember the taste of their tea and the flasks of canty they sometimes liberated, I think is the word. We all got together occasionally because I was serving with His Majesty's Navy in the Eastern Mediterranean, sailing small ships out of Alexandria. That's it, hold on that course. Steady as she goes, Cox. Steady as she goes, sir. This is the very first MTB ever built. Nowadays, she's run by the Sea Scouts, and she has a glorious history, including being flagship at Dunkirk. Although my service was in the Mediterranean and not in a channel, service conditions on board these boats were very much alike. Line of sight navigation normally, it's only when you went out to sea that you held a course, as you do in big ships. You then wrote it down on the blackboard, like this, and then one of our ratings used the chalk to make little tiny chalk models like this out of them. The trouble was, these models never survived because there was, the chalk was used again and the models were literally written off. But the art of making small-scale ship models is still alive. 
Phil Warren makes his out of nothing but matchboxes and matchsticks. I'm just putting the last piece of decking on the deck of the model of HMS Scimitar, which is the modern equivalent of the ship that we're on now. It's a fast training boat and carries no weapons at all. It's just purely built for speed in training exercises. And when finished, will look like her sister ship, the Cutlass. The tool kit is simply this. I have a razor blade for cutting the wood and the matchsticks, a six inch steel rule, and a small pair of tweezers, and that's a lot. How many ships have you got in your fleet? Uh, 125 in the whole fleet, ranging from aircraft carriers down to the scimitar. And one of the nicest ships in the fleet is the Sheffield, the Navy's latest Type 42 destroyer. Still made in exactly the same way, with framework of matchsticks. Wood from the box is the plating. Now, using that wood from the box, we can also make all sorts of details work. This very fine radar is, is simply that wood cut up. Bits of radar can revolve on a matchstick spindle. Missiles can revolve and elevate, also on matchstick spindles. There's no pins or wires, no cheating at all. Guns revolve and elevate. And all the little tiny details, such as the carbus as used there, all made out of the matchwood. The curious thing about Phil Warren is that although he reckons he's used 50,000 matches to build his fleet, he doesn't smoke. 